Welcome to Living a Luxury Lifestyle, where we talk with influencers in luxury lifestyle products and services from around the globe. I'm your host, Cliff Parati. Welcome to another episode of Living a Luxury Life. I'm your host, Cliff Parati. Today, we'll be talking with Amy Leahy, the Director of Sales and Marketing for Kempton's Hotel Monaco in downtown Chicago. As a young girl, Amy looked forward to spending time with her grandmother because she knew that they would go downtown shopping and spend time in hotel lobbies where they would sit and have tea. She always found that experience to be a little magical. Today, after graduating from Lewis University in 2004, she finds herself a leader in the luxury industry within the hospitality world. With that, let's welcome Amy Leahy. So welcome to A Luxury Life, Amy Leahy. Thank you. Thank you for having me. So we always like to start the show off by um, just learning a little bit about you and your background. I know that you were born and raised in Illinois uh, and specifically on Chicago's Southwest side. So I have to ask the really important question first. Are you ready? Yes. Sox fan or Cubs fan? Oh, Cliff, you already know. I'm a Sox fan. Of course. Of course I am. You didn't, you didn't throw anything at me, so that's a good sign. <laughs> I've been to a Cub game or two, um, but no, I am a, a Sox fan through and through. Can't wait to get back out to the ball. Oh, I'm so excited. And I know they're going to have limited seating and stuff happening, so this is going to be really fun. I know, yeah. So tell us a little bit about your background, if you would. Uh, I, I always say, tell us your story. How did you end up? How did you, where did you start from and how did you end up um, in your position um, with the Hotel Monaco? Absolutely. Um, so the, the kind of quickest way um, to look at kind of how things started was uh, it was purely by accident in a lot of ways that I ended up in hotels. Uh, I, de- I um, graduated college with a degree in marketing and PR. I uh, knew that I probably wasn't going to go the agency route, but I wasn't exactly sure what that next step was going to be. Uh, at the time, um, I had a great friend who I'm still very uh, close friends with. Her sister uh, worked at a hotel here in Chicago. And I thought that she was cool and seemed like she had a really great job. And it seemed like a lot of fun. In hindsight, I've, you know, of course, thought a lot about it. I've always loved hotels. Uh, it's been a big part of my family history. I mean, a lot of this is not surprising when I really think about it, but it uh, happened quite by accident. She set me up for an interview as a catering coordinator and that's how it started. So um, really got going more on the event side, but found that I had, uh, I don't want to say kind of a knack for sales, but that I kind of appreciated the sales process and how it works in a hotel, how that works in hospitality, and what we can kind of do on the sales and marketing side uh, in, in a building like I'm sitting in now in the Monaco. Right. And so that's when I um, kind of made the shift. It's not always uh, in this world, the, the easiest transitions to go from event kind of planning and management into sales because you need someone to take a chance on you. You know, you're right. responsible for, uh, for producing and you need someone that's ready to kind of help guide you in that direction. I was lucky enough to, um, you know, have a great mentor in that way at the time. So made that transition into sales and then here I am, but I've spent um, a number of years in the boutique space. So that's where my experience has been. Worked in a number of really fantastic boutique properties and really been a part of the ins and outs and what that means and how you can really build and hone in on a brand. Um, and then of course, to be able to do that at Kimpton was always a dream because working for smaller independent boutique hotels was great because you get your hands in a lot of different areas that maybe in a larger brand, a larger company you don't have access to. Uh, but I mean, we were all trying to emulate Kempton. <laughs> well, well you know, and, and it's interesting because uh, Kempton has such high ratings amongst their employees. Um, so they, they clearly know how to treat their people. And especially in the hospitality industry, it's all people <laughs> at the end of the yeah. day. Yeah, yeah. So yeah, the company does an incredibly admirable job and it's not just lip service, it's the truth of yeah. finding um, people that can grow within the company, that bring the spirit to the company and to the day-to-day hotel operation uh, that, that really stand, is really what Kimpton stands for. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, the rest you can teach. You can teach 
um, you, you know, how to, how to do someone something, in. but you can't of teach culture, right? I mean, they have to have that. There's some part of that has to be in that person. Um, yes. Yeah. So, and, and it's funny, we'll talk, we'll come, we'll circle back to that because it's an actually in some of the interviews that we've done for uh, living a luxury life, mm -hmm. one of the huge commonalities we're seeing amongst these luxury brands is the way they treat their people, which is really interesting to me. Um, now, you know, here you are, this power broker at a major boutique hotel. Um, you also uh, are a mom of three kids, which tells me you have to be a homeschool teacher. And uh, how have you juggled all of this uh, during this last crazy pandemic year that hopefully, knock on wood, we're coming out of? I know. Yeah, I, I believe we're coming to a real uh, kind of turning point, particularly in our market in Chicago. Um, I'm seeing some really hopeful signs, but it's been um, so challenging in a lot of the ways that uh, I think a lot of people can relate to. So yeah, I have three small children, uh, all three, five and under. So I have five-year-old twins. Wow. And then a little guy that is two. Um, so it's been, um, it's been very uh, interesting. I, I, I almost, <laughs> I'm sorry, I don't even almost know how to put it into words. It's probably probably going to take some time and some yes. distance from all of this to really be able to to fully verbalize what it's been like. In my case, though, I do think that there are some things um, that are lucky about my kids being the age that they are, because mm -hmm. I think that we've been able to kind of manage for them what this has been like. Um, right. You know, they're they're not that that older age that I think is really struggling with, you know, human connection and friends and all of that. Um, so it's been it's been awfully interesting, but I have the most incredible support system uh, that that has really, um, you know, come up and and just been a huge, huge, huge help because I have been fortunate to to keep working this through this entire time and through this rocky road. Uh, so it's been a lot of um, juggling and working hours that. Um, you know, we're a little bit outside of, of the, the business hours just to get everything done and um, incredibly lucky again to not only have my own personal support system, but to have an incredibly supportive company um, and knowing that that we're all really going through a lot. Well, and it's interesting um, in the conversations that we've had about some other items. Um, you know, you're working out of your home and every, I think everybody's doing that. You know, we, we, it used to be the no, 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 don't do that. Now it's like, who cares? I don't really I care where somebody's at, you know, as long as we can talk and get through our business. And, and I, I, I think in that sense, we've even, in fact, it was uh, just today, they announced that some of the major companies are like Salesforce and so forth. are already saying to them, their staff and people, you know what, your job, you don't need to come into an office. You can do yeah. from home if you want to and remote. And um, so I, I, you know, I, I, <laughs> I recognize both the, success in having done so and the PTSD of having done so. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I am. I'm so thoroughly pleased. I'm not in my home right now. As you can probably yeah. tell, I don't have this amazing uh, hand ro woven rope wall in my dining room. I'm in our restaurant, Fisk and Co. So I have taken the steps to come back in a couple of days a week, especially in this kind of business that we're in to be physically on property in the space, in the hotel. Uh, it makes a huge difference. Absolutely. So, and, and especially yeah. you, you just never know, it, you know, it just helps your psyche too. I think yes. in terms of coming in. Yeah. Um, so you, you kind of stumbled into hospitality, but you, you tell a story in your bio of um, getting exposure to luxury hotels from your, is it your grandmother that kind of yeah. exposed you to that? Yes, so, yeah, tell absolutely. Tell us about that. Tell I was incredibly that. close to my grandmother. She was a school teacher, so I spent a lot of time with her because our, our time off from school and our breaks and all of those things aligned. She didn't drive, um, but she loved to get out and explore, and we would do some really, really fun things together. Uh, so one of our favorites was, uh, again, I grew up on the Southwest side of Chicago, as you'd mentioned. This was before the Orange Line was in existence. So oh. we would take the bus downtown uh -huh. uh, pretty often and go shopping and hit all of our spots and have lunch. But we would always stop in the Palmer House, uh, you know, for a snack and just to sit down. And there was something that I just, I loved so, I mean, I adored my grandmother. So spending time with her was just the most fun, but uh -huh. to be in that incredibly grand space, that so grand luxe kind of traditional mm -hmm. uh, lobby 
with the entrance and the staircase and the whole deal. Um, I mean, clearly that's had a little bit of an impact. It doesn't all happen by accident, right? Um, no, in, so in, that was- Yeah, I think in fact, when you look back, it, I, I, it's so funny because you, you look back and there are clues, you know, in your life of moments that say, hey, you know what, I really enjoyed that or I really liked that. And I had a, an inclination towards that. And I wasn't even thinking that. And as I'm going through school, I'm sure. Um, so, yeah, luxury hotels, you know, I mean, it's, it's interesting. And we're going to talk about your property at length because I think it's a very unique, uh, it's just a great place. Um, when we talk about luxury, what does luxury mean? to Amy? You know, I think that that, that answer can vary a little bit um, based on kind of the context that you talk about it and when we're talking about it. What is considered a luxury now, I think we have to acknowledge is probably a little bit different than what we considered a luxury, you know, two years ago. But in my sort of day-to-day -day life and how I approach both my, you know, personal life, but particularly uh, what I do here at the Monaco is for me, you know, you can check all the boxes and have um, the high thread count linen and beautiful artwork and all of those great things that I think are the foundation for, for what we do every day. But if you can't anticipate the guest needs in advance and how varied those might be and how they might change, and if you can't adapt uh, to those changes and make those kind of calculated assumptions in advance, uh, that's where I think you miss the mark, but that to me is luxury. So anticipating what a guest will want, need, require before they even step in our doors so they don't even have to ask for it, I think is what provides really that base luxury experience. Uh, I, I couldn't agree more. I mean, you hit on the two key issues, aesthetics, obviously, um, have to be there. And then the, but the real proof in the pudding is, you know, you could have a, a lovely place, but have terrible service and <laughs> people aren't coming back. You know what I mean? Yeah. Um, yeah. So in fact, it's, it's funny because I've had, I've had some really great meals in your restaurant right there, actually. Um, and it always has been, in, in fact, if, if I think about, um, I stayed at one of your competitors hotels in a different marketplace. And um, it's an up and coming kind of boutique -y company and with a name that makes no sense to me, but, but in, in doing so their brand, it, it looked pretty, but there was a disconnect between the, the staff and the level of service and the image of the hotel, if that makes sense. Yeah, um, and that doesn't work for me. You know, it just, I, I, that sticks in my head and I'm going, nah, that's okay. Um, mm -hmm. And I've stayed in. Uh, well, I'll talk about the Monaco brand. So let's 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 jump a little bit into, um, and thank you for sharing some of those insights and a little bit about your background. Let's talk about Kempton. Um, for those people that are not familiar with the Kempton Hotel, I won't say chain, but the brand is a better way of putting it. Um, company's been around. Uh, got seventy-seven hotels and. 50 plus cities. Um, give us a little background, if you would, about Kempton. Yeah, well, I think that the word boutique has become really prevalent in the last even 10 years or so uh, in so many industries, but particularly in hotels, the boutique experience, the boutique property, everyone wants to be boutique. Even the large brands uh, have boutique arms now. But if you wanna go back to the beginning, Kimpton was truly where that experience started. So the company was founded by Bill Kimpton in 1981 in San Francisco. Uh, the Monaco, the building I'm sitting in now, has been here since 1999. So we have more than a few years under our belts and have weathered, uh, you know, a number of different storms. Nothing quite like we have the last year, but, um, you know, interesting times always in this industry. And Kimpton really is the leader in the boutique space. I think that that's not, uh, you know, too boastful to say. I, I truly believe it's, it's the truth. And we offer uh, so many experiences here that I think are really unique um, among our wider competitive set. So as you'd mentioned, it is truly within the DNA of the brand uh, that the service that you are providing to our guests is, is genuine, heartfelt, and I truly believe it's it's like welcoming someone into your home. And, and Bill Kempton was very much about that from the, from the very beginning 
in fact, we call our lobbies, not lobbies, we call them living rooms. And mm -hmm. they're designed aesthetically. And you've probably noticed this. Maybe even if you didn't know it, you can picture it now. Oh, if you yeah. stayed at it, not only at our property, but at other Kimpton hotels across the world, the, the living rooms are, are designed to be conversational. They're designed to bring people together uh, and to really kind of foster that warmth and that community that translates uh, into a very high-end experience. Mm -hmm. uh, it's interesting. The, the, uh, the Hotel Monaco, and, and we've talked about this, but I've had experience at the Monaco, not only as a guest, which is delightful and I'll come back to, but also as a business person. I have rented rooms there to do presentations. I released one of my courses there yeah. and got such great treatment from your sales and catering department, right? Where they were just, man, boom, everything was taken care of. And and it, it lived up to what I expected. And it really helps when you're doing these business meetings and, you know, it, it creates that sense of luxury. I mean, it's really Very important. Um, and, and I've had those meetings sitting in your living room. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Oh my goodness. Now, now the Monaco is a brand that's not just, is, is it now just in Chicago? Cause I, I, no. I believe you had one in Portland as well. I don't know. If yeah, that's there are Monaco's there. all across the country. So okay. under the Kimpton umbrella, you'll find Monaco's, you'll find Palomar's and then you'll find, uh, not one off. That's not quite the right term I'm looking for, but properties that are, are named in and of themselves, like the gray here in Chicago. Right. Right. Uh, not to say that there, you know, wouldn't be if someone's watching this sometime in the future, at that point, there wouldn't be another gray. But right. um, yeah, Monaco is definitely, I think, considered kind of a legacy brand mm -hmm. uh, within the Kimpton portfolio, uh, because it was it was really one of the first that was that was built in this way. Um, you, you just you just mentioned I was going to ask you, are there any other uh, Kempton brands within the Chicagoland marketplace? Yeah, yeah. So the Gray is our sister property, a um, little bit further into the loop, kind of financial district. Um, a beautiful, beautiful, beautiful building. Um, Kimpton does a really uh, incredible job being very thoughtful about adaptive reuse of interesting and historic buildings. The Gray is a great example of that. The Monaco is a great example of that. Uh, this building in its heyday in the early 1900s was the largest hat factory in the country. In fact, the room I'm sitting in right now is called Millinery. So uh, the largest hat factory in the country, DB Fisk and Co. Uh, and, and we have little nods to that and little touches throughout the property. Um, but we have some of our hotels you know, across the country that our old banks and train stations. So uh, very, very thoughtful in, in choosing spaces and the designing those spaces in a way that really speaks to the market that they sit in. So if you were to go to the Monaco, you were to sit here in the Monaco in Chicago, you were to leave here and hop on over to Denver and then onto Portland from there, each of those three properties would have similarities in terms of the guest experience, but would be very different because we're three very different markets, three very and, different and cities. Yeah, the uh, I've, I've been in the Monaco in Portland, um, and it's 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 a different architecture. I mean, it just really is, yeah. and yeah. Um, so I appreciate that very much. But I I think the level of service is you know it's like I hate to make this comparison, but when you go to a, a, any brand wherever you go, you want mm -hmm. certain things to be the same. And uh, when I think of Monaco, the Monaco, the experience needs to be the same yes. wherever I'm at. Um, now, Kempton's uh, slated, I, I was looking, I was fascinated on their website. They're slated to open like a bunch of hotels in 2021, including Paris, Bali, Mexico City, and another one, the Alton in San Francisco. Are those, are those still scheduled or did we get some of that pushed back due to the pandemic? No, to my understanding, those are still scheduled to go ahead. Um, and I think what's been really, you know, kind of key to that, uh, that worldwide expansion, Barcelona um, is another one that's going to be uh, slated for opening soon, um, is the relationship that we have with IHG. So Intercontinental Hotels right. uh, purchased Kimpton a number of years ago and has really helped kind of uh, make that transition into more of a, a worldwide brand as to previously being, you know, primarily located here in the States. You uh, mentioned the history of that building and the hat company that it yeah. once was. Um, you, you just also went through a renovation, I believe, right? Recently in the last few years. We did, yeah. So we did um, a, a full property renovation, guest rooms, public space, lobby living room, uh, pretty top to bottom in early 2019. So that was completed early to mid 2019, I would even say. Um, but we had some lost time there. So we had just come out of 
of our big renovation, um, we had a, a lot of strategy and ideas and things that we wanted to implement and put into place. We were able to do a lot of that, but then 2020 happened. Uh, wow. So some of that was, you know, put on hold. So now I think we're moving into the, the next phase of how we can kind of um, drive some of those things forward. But I still feel like we have an incredibly fresh and dynamic uh, design here that we're very excited about. Good location too, very central, easy, easy to get around. Um, how many rooms do they have in the Monaco when you say boutique, boutique so to speak, boutique, that was my Texan. Um, <laughs> <laughs> how many rooms do you have in the Monaco? In our boutique hotel, we have 191. Okay. Yeah, so it's that perfect size, right under 200. But mm -hmm. I think you can still provide a, a really great boutique experience, even slightly larger than that. We have some of our properties, um, the Gray in, here in Chicago, for example. Um, we have a large property in San Francisco. So I think you can still provide that same experience at a larger property. Um, you have to be, you know, pretty deft in how you do it, and you have to yeah. have things really um, keyed in and really narrowed down. But um, I do think that you can provide the same kind of um, hands-on, top-notch, first-rate luxury experience, even in a larger setting. Now, the Monaco has received four stars from AAA. Uh, it's been recognized as one of the top ho best hotels in Chicago by US News and World. Um, and having stayed there, I can tell you firsthand, the, the accommodations are, extremely elegant all right i have to be honest the best beds in the world yes you have the thank best you i'm glad beds. you said it so i again didn't sound like i was just <laughs> no even doing a pitch or something no it is it's it's notable and um and it's like wow okay this is amazing unfortunately you've set the bar so high that's like okay now i go to some other i've I've been to other luxury brands and it's like, yeah, ah, this isn't the same. It's bit. not quite the same. Yeah. Can you elaborate on some of these little touches that, uh, you know, that you, I guess that makes it exceptional. Cause I know there's a bunch of little subtleties that you mentioned on your website and, and some of your uh, PR stuff. Touch yeah, of course. I think the very first that I would have to mention before I even get into the, the kind of concrete uh, and tangible things that we do, mm -hmm. it is absolutely without a doubt, the people. Mm -hmm. Without question, there is no way we would be able to do what we do here every day mm -hmm. without the incredible team that we have. Uh, and I'm looking this way because our front desk is just beyond me and I'm thinking of them specifically, but everyone behind the scenes and our housekeeping team. And I mean, truly it is, it is a, a team of people here and not just here, but I, I know in so many of our hotels uh, that offer a really exceptional service. But I think that that's what we are so proud of at the Monaco. Uh, even more so than, you know, our, our beautiful guest rooms, our incredible location. Um, it's really the people and how we're able to connect with our guests that I think keeps bringing people back um, year after year, trip after trip, week after week, you know, for road warriors that, that we see all the time. Um, beyond that, at any Kimpton hotel, you're going to have our wine hour. Anyone that stayed at a Kimpton hotel loves wine hour. Uh, that... I don't know what you're talking about. What do you mean? <laughs> <laughs> uh, so each property does it a little bit different because again, we're not cut and paste. We're not all exactly the same. Um, but here at the Monaco, well, at every hotel, I should say from five to six. Um, and here at the Monaco, you'll get an option of white, red, rosé, if it's seasonally appropriate, something holiday, if we're in the holiday season, something summery, uh, you know, through June and July. So it's just a really fantastic time for us to be able to connect with guests to provide something that uh, is very welcoming and that again really invites that you know come into our living room and come and sit down and have a glass of wine and you know chat if you'd like sit quietly with your wine if you'd like um, whatever that might be this is the space to do it and we're happy to provide that for you that's been a Kimpton hallmark since the very beginning there's an interesting story around that um it sounds like folklore but it really is true uh in the first Kimpton property in San Francisco Bill Kimpton would hold a daily debrief with the sales team happened mm -hmm. to be over wine happened to be in the lobby you talk about successes of the day maybe some things not necessarily failures but things you might want to do differently approach right. differently strategy you might want to to um you know mess with a little bit the following day and guests started to notice and again what do you do when someone's in your home, this is our home, someone's in your home, come and join us, come and sit down, you're welcome, we're happy you're here, here's your glass of wine, and it, it evolved into the wine hour that we all know and love today, uh, you, so it's, it's a highlight. 
And you also, you, I mean, I, I think of the little touches in terms of your linens. I mean, these are, oh, yeah. these are little things, but that, you know, we talked about what is luxury, but that is attention to details. It's the, the little much. things that in a cumulative event, it just really help, uh, uh, bring it all together. Um, yeah, beyond the linens, the the layout of the bathroom and what does counter space and lighting look like? Where's the art placed? And how do the outlets make you know the the best and most useful uh, use of space for guests? Knowing what all of our lives are like now and how many devices we have to plug in. I mean, sure. it truly is each and every single detail that's thought through. That again provides those experiences for guests that you might not even notice. The guests shouldn't notice yeah. um, because we've thought it through so well that they don't even have to. Now, I, I have to share with our audience that one of the things I love about your rooms is that you guys have window seats. Oh, it's, and, and it's, like, yeah. it's, like, it's so cool. You sit there, you read a book, you look at your paper, you're you're looking out over the street. Do all of the rooms have those window seats or is it just some of the them? The vast majority do in some way, shape or form. Of course, on one side of the building, if anyone is, is you know, watching or listening familiar with our location, we have truly, uh, as you mentioned, uh, incredibly central and an incredible location near the river. So it's really kind of a, a one of a kind view that, you know, we have in Chicago, this river running through the middle of our city. It's, it's true. It's, yeah. it's really, really unique. And our window seats just are an incredible feature that, that really take advantage of, of, you know, that uniqueness that we have available to us in Chicago. So the vast majority of our rooms do have a window seat of some sort, mm -hmm. but as you mentioned, it's great to, you know, sit and quietly read a book, just look at the traffic below, uh, sit with your coffee. Uh, it, it, is, it is a one of a kind experience, I believe. And uh, something that was a really key planning feature uh, as, as the renovation was underway about two years ago, really playing up those window seats, knowing how important they are to us. Yeah, to no, it really sets it apart. And, and you, you, you touched on, you know, when you talk about reading a book, one of the things that I loved was an, and I thought it was an innovative idea is something you have, you call your library cart. Can you tell yeah. us about that? Yeah, yeah. So we, uh, I would say probably about two years ago now, we developed this really great library cart that we curated. We actually at the time worked with Newberry Library, which again, anyone local in Chicago will understand uh, kind of the history of that space. But it's a really beautiful and historic library space, bookstore, bookseller. Uh, so we had a great contact there that helped curate some of their favorite uh, books for us. We had our team, you know, talking about their favorite books all across the hotel, purchasing those and bringing those in. So we were able to really deck that book cart out with a little bit of everything from thrillers and mysteries to, you know, great memoirs and children's books. So it was a really key piece that lived in our lobby. It doesn't currently because of, uh, you know, cleanliness um, restrictions and things like that, but we're awfully excited to bring it back soon. And Kimpton actually has a new um, partnership that will be launched soon that I think will play off of this as well. So uh, sometime in the next 10 days or so, you can look out for that. What, 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 what kind of a, uh... What kind of a partnership is this? Are we having, I know it's not the official press release, but is there some insider hint you can give us? Yes, yes. So uh, definitely something that will make it easier for guests to read with us while they're while they're in the hotel. It's a company that I think a lot oh. of people that, uh, you know, are voracious readers, which I know um, I am. And there's yes. nothing quite like, you know, just sitting, in, you know, quietly in the space like the Monaco or in our living room and having a really great book. And we know how important that is to so many of our guests. And it's a nice little amenity that we're able to offer. So uh, we'll have books through a partner available to, to kind of grab and go and take back to your room and then deliver back to the desk on your way uh, out as you're checking right, out. Well, I look forward to that press release and we, yes. you've teased us properly. Um, so, you know, and one of the things that uh, I always admire about certain companies that are uh, what I consider to be luxury brands and, and, you know, luxury doesn't mean that it's an isolate. It's, it's not an elitist to the extent that you've eliminated the common man, so to speak, you know, yeah. and uh, you guys have a, a really interesting program with Columbia College. Um, tell us about that, because I, I found, you know, I am a student at Columbia, so I, I found that fascinating. So tell me. Tell us yeah, about it. yeah. Uh, it's something that we're so proud of. We have this really gorgeous 
one of a kind handmade piece in our lobby living room. It's where we actually serve our wine hour wine. So it's kind of our little hosting table, if you will. Uh, and it has these gorgeous glass cases that we're just calling for some kind of display, something unique and interesting. So we were able to partner with Columbia College here in Chicago, and they curated a little collection of pieces that really called back to the history of the building. So um, you'll find some uh, shoes, some ladies, slippers, uh, uh -huh. some accessories, little write-ups about what life and fashion were like uh, in the early 1900s, kind mm -hmm. of bringing guests back as they're maybe waiting for their glass of wine or sipping on their glass of wine in the evening, a cup of coffee in the morning, to be able to just kind of mill over these pieces. And your mind, you know, takes you back to what this building, we know what it is now, but what yeah. was it like when it was the largest millinery in the country and really bustling at a time that was uh, so big in Chicago's history. And so, yeah, we have our own little, I feel like curated, you know, museum collection. Columbia has been incredibly generous to let us put these pieces on display for the last year. Well, and I, I have to say one of the things that uh, you, you're, you're literally blocks away from Columbia College yeah. and their fashion uh, design program there. Uh, one of our interns, in fact, is in that program. And um, and just having seen their annual exhibits and student productions and stuff, I, I, it's unbelievable talent coming out of there. Yeah. And so we did something really interesting with a class in the School of Fashion Design. Oh, really? In, not this holiday season, but the one before, yeah. where uh, the class's final project was to, they came and did a full site tour, top to bottom. Right. And then they were tasked with creating a hat that they felt was Monaco and it could be anything. It could be any style, any sort of hat is something that spoke to them about their time that they spent here at the Monaco. And then we put those pieces on display in our living room with, with little uh, credit cards next to them, cards giving credit to the designers. And right. we had a, a little holiday happy hour and invited clients and, and people that we work with in the city to really come in and see what we were able to do with this incredibly talented class at Columbia. We invited the students and it was, it was a great time. It was something that, uh, yeah, I still think back to. It was really fun. Well, and I, it's just great to be in, get your community involved. I, th I think yeah. it's an important part. Now, so if you had to summarize the Hotel Monaco brand mm -hmm. in a couple of words, what would you say? Well, I would speak about the Monaco Chicago most specifically. Okay. Um, and I would say we're approachable. Okay. Very approachable. Everyone is welcome and should feel comfortable here. I, as you kind of mentioned, luxury, the idea of luxury, the term luxury should be limiting in any way. Everyone is deserving of a luxury experience. So anyone can feel comfortable within these four walls. And we're just so thrilled that you're here. So approachable, genuine service is what we are all about. And then, uh, you know, let us worry about all of the little touches behind the scenes. So again, our guests can just come in and, and do the things that that they're you know meant to do we understand people are away from their homes when they're with us and whether that's by choice because they're on you know a fun leisure trip or you know maybe a business trip and and they're not you know all that excited to be leaving their home base what can we do to make uh the time that they're spending with us comfortable warm and everything that they're looking for while they're here in chicago well and, and you know i'm just thinking i'm realizing that some people coming in from certain states were required to theoretically isolate for 14 yeah. days. I mean, yeah. were people staying in their room for two weeks with you <laughs> before they could go out and do business? Yeah, yeah. Oh and you know, there was, it, it when really at the, if we want to say the height of things, um, right. we, you, you and I both know what downtown Chicago was like at that time. I think it's coming ghost back town. in a yeah. lot of ways, but yeah, it was, it was a relative ghost town. So yeah. um, we had a lot of guests that were with us for a number of reasons, any reason you can um, think of, but not necessarily to Dime because right, right. restaurants weren't open, not necessarily to go to museums because they weren't open. Right. Uh, so yeah, we had people, you know, passing through on road trips, moving across country and needed a, a, a you know, safe, warm, welcoming place to stay. And we're happy to be that along the way. So does the Hotel Monaco have any special projects or things happening uh, as you look forward to 2021? Yeah, so we've been doing a little series that I'm awfully excited about. Anyone watching should go check out our Instagram. Okay. Uh, you'll see us going live. We've gone live the last two Mondays. 
Uh, and so all of March, I should say every Monday. So the last two and then the upcoming two Mondays in March, we're going live with a female business owner, kind of really honing in on, on this, this women's history month and how can we highlight um, female business owners that we feel are in very different industries from us, but there's still so much alignment among yeah. the brands. Yeah. So we've had really, really fantastic conversations so far. I think that they're, I'm probably biased because I hosted the first two. <laughs> But well, and, and honestly, I think one of the things that's happened as a result of the COVID experience is that we as a community of luxury service providers, or just any bit, I think we appreciate our fellow people more. You, oh my gosh. It's yes. like you, you just want to hear their story. And, and, and you just, I think that's a blessing that's really uh, come out of this is that- yeah. Um, we really do. There are some really great stories out there and um, it's great that you're bringing some of those forth. That's great. Yeah. And something I, I would be remiss not to mention as well, kind of when you're, when you're looking at blessings during this time, something else we've been incredibly focused on, not that we weren't before, but I think we've had a, a different eye on it. We've been able to really kind of look at things in a different way. I think that the packages we're providing to travelers now, and I'm confident that we'll continue to do this into the future, certainly into 2022, um, are really honed in and really specific. And I think provide really fantastic kind of all encompassing experiences mm -hmm. to guests. So anyone that travels is familiar with a breakfast package, a valet package, we have those because yeah. there are people that those speak to that that is a great value. We want to make sure that those things are available, but we have some really well built out family packages, understanding that family travel is different now. Um, you know, it's not maybe as easy to get away uh, on your own with your significant other. So kids are coming on more trips uh, and getaways and staycations than they maybe were previously. So mm -hmm. what can we offer and really think about every element so that we're providing you that really all in experience. Um, and we're really thinking about our partnerships and who we're working with. Mm -hmm. um, and I think giving that a different focus than necessarily we were previously. Not that we weren't focused on it, but yeah, just, it's, there's it's a different perspective now, right? Detail. Yeah, no, yeah. You, it just, it gives us an opportunity to excel and um, rethink and, and dig deeper instead yeah. of just kind of, I think too often uh, in the past, we just glazed over certain things. We didn't treat them with the importance that we do today is a better way of saying Yeah, it. yeah. And I mean, I think it's because there in so many ways we were just on this wheel of around and around and around and around and around and around and so busy and being pulled in so many directions, both personally and professionally. Sure. Um, and even though the pace of that hasn't necessarily slowed down, I know that, you know, so many of us are still working so hard and, and wanting, you know, to, to really see results and give everything our all, uh, maybe taking on things that we hadn't been doing previously and just giving it everything we can. Uh, in some ways, we've still had that opportunity to step back and uh, have a new perspective on things, look at things with a different lens and kind of have the, the, the brain space to really do that. Mm -hmm. Well, Amy Leahy, you are indeed a luxury influencer out here. And um, it's been an absolute pleasure having you on our podcast. Thank and you. we will see you out in the industry. Thank you very much for being with us. Thank you. Thank you so much for having me. It was really nice to talk with you. Likewise. Okay, bye-bye. Bye-bye. Thank you for listening in on this episode of Living a Luxury Life. This program is brought to you by the Luxury Marketing Council, a global network of leaders and influencers in the international luxury industry. Join us next time as we discuss trending topics with luxury lifestyle influencers. I'm your host, Cliff Parati. Thank you for tuning in.